Hey, thanks, Jeff, for having the guys come up and sing. That was fun. That was fun. It made a, a hot room feel even hotter for me <laughs> to sing in front of all of you, but that's okay. We live in a confusing time. We live in a time when the institution of marriage in America is in steady decline. The statistics all say the same thing. People are getting married later. Fewer people are even getting married while divorce is on the rise. Cohabitation is on the rise. Since 1990, the marriage rate in America of those who are 18 years or older has fallen by 9%. Meanwhile, the divorce rate of those who are 50 and older has doubled. And the divorce rate of those 65 and older has tripled. In just the last two years alone, the statistics for those who choose to live together outside of marriage has risen 29% in the last two years. Half of those are under 35 years of age. Meanwhile, public opinion on same-sex marriage has never been higher. 62% of Americans are in favor of same-sex marriage. We live in a time in which the radical consequences of the sexual revolution are finally being felt a generation later. A time in which all things sexual are permissible. Nothing, it seems, is taboo. Everything is an option. Children are growing up without their biological parents. Abortion on demand, which claims nearly a million innocent lives each year, is a billion-dollar industry. And just this week, the CDC reports that sexually transmitted diseases are seeing record increases. We live in a time in which the very essence of what it means to be a male or a female is subject to preference or whim. And in the midst of all this, there's Christians who are struggling to make sense of it all. Marriage, sex, gender, these are these hot topics of our culture that many of us find ourselves baffled over. We don't know how to think about these things. We don't know how to speak about these things. And when we do speak, we feel like we've said the wrong thing. These are confusing times. But the message for you this morning is that they need not be. Paul in Ephesians chapter 5, talking about the secret of mystery, says these mysteries have been revealed. Answers to these questions that we have can be found, and they can be found in God's Word. You see, marriage and sex and gender are all God's idea. They're not our idea. They're His idea. What God institutes, God regulates. And therefore, for us as Christians, the question is, what does the Bible say? And if the Bible has something to say on these issues, we have to view, those, we have to view what the Bible says as crucial. We have to seek to understand what the Bible says. We have to make every effort to obey and submit to God's purposes. So over the next several weeks, we're going to base our time together investigating these issues by looking at just a few verses from the 19th chapter of the book of Matthew. If you want to turn there, I'm going to read just a few verses today, but we're going to keep returning to these verses in the weeks to come. These are the words from the Lord's own mouth, Jesus himself, responding to questions about divorce and marriage. I'm going to begin in verse 1 and read through verse 4. We're going to focus on verse 4 today. Matthew chapter 19, verse 1. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went down to the region of Judea, east of the Jordan River. Large crowds followed him there, and he healed their sick. Some Pharisees came and tried to trap him with this question. Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife for just any reason? Haven't you read the scriptures? Jesus replied. They record that from the beginning, God made them male and female. From the beginning, God. In responding to this trap question concerning divorce, and that's what it was, Jesus responds by pointing them to the first couple chapters of Genesis. 
You see, God's original intent and design for humanity has not changed. What he instituted in the beginning is what we are pointing towards at the end, and it's what he intends for all the time in between the beginning and the end. You see, the Bible in all of history begins with a wedding. As we look through the Genesis creation account in chapters 1 and 2, we see that all of God's creation was good. But it's not until you get to chapter 2, around verse 18, that there's something not good up as part of God's creation. And this is before sin enters the equation. So there's something about God's equation that is about God's creation that is not good in chapter 2. And it is this. God himself says, it is not good for the man to be alone. And so... God institutes the first parade, and he takes all the animals of the earth, and he parades them before Adam, and Adam is given the task of naming each kind as they come by. Why is he doing this? What is the point? Why a parade? Well, God wants the man to realize that he is alone in all of creation. There's there's nothing else like him. And so once this point is made, God causes Adam to fall into a deep sleep. From, and, and during that sleep, he takes a rib from his side and he fashions a masterpiece. A woman. Mm, a woman. Praise Jesus for women. The man wakes up and sees something he's never seen before. And he said, uh-oh. <laughs> and he says... At last, this one is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. This one is like me. This one is different than all the other creatures. This one looks like me, sounds like me, is like me, and yet this one's not like me. And Genesis chapter 2 ends with the two who are like each other but not like each other, Becoming one. Part of God's very good creation. Now it's interesting, as the the Bible begins with a wedding, history begins with a wedding, but it also ends with a wedding. Revelation 19.7 says, Let us be glad and rejoice, and let us give honor to him. For the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb, and his bride has prepared herself. Who is his bride? It's, It's you. It's me. The bride of Christ, the church, the people of God are presented to to her groom, the Lamb of God, to enjoy union forever and ever. The Bible begins and ends with a wedding. And if that is true, then I suggest that that maybe this means that there's something significant about marriage itself. There's something about it, something about these two weddings, something about marriage that points us beyond Marriage itself to something deeper and something more profound. I think first, it points to the reality of who God is. Jaden did such a wonderful job this morning. I love, I love when our kids start us off by reading scripture. It's particularly cute when it's, it's been months since we haven't heard from them. So we give thanks to Jaden for being brave to, to start us off for the new school year. He did such a great job. And Jaden read for us from Genesis chapter 1. And this, this passage that talks about how when, when God created man and woman, he created them in his own image. Genesis 1.27, God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So what Genesis is saying is that within the one human nature, and you and I all share a common human nature, there's something that makes us distinct from the rest of creation. There's something that all of us share in common. That's what we talk about as our nature, to be a human being. It's the same thing Jesus assumed. The the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, when he came into this world, he assumed our nature. He became what we are, and he joined it to who he is. Within the one human nature, however, there is distinction. And we're given that distinction here in Genesis 1, male and female. And it's not hard to tell the two apart. It's one of the things I've always noticed about my children, one of the earliest things they've been able to identify from from the youngest of age is the difference between a man and a woman. And that's without knowing anything about sexuality or any of those big words. They're little kids, two-year-olds, can say that's a boy, that's a girl. 
That's a man, that's a woman. A man is not a woman. A woman is not a man. They're not the same. And yet, in the wisdom of God's design, each is incomplete without the other. And it's in this distinction of sexual difference that humans can find a God-ordered physiological completion and unity. And it's beautiful, and it's whole, and it's, it's exactly what God had in mind. And from, furthermore, from the union of these two comes another. Is there anything more amazing and profound and mysterious than the miracle of, of childbirth? I'll never forget the, the week we brought home Savannah from the hospital, our first child. We had some friends over, and there's a, a group of us in the living room, and I'm holding my daughter, and she's days old. And I looked down in her face, and I, I was, it, it stunned me. Because in the face of this beautiful, sleeping infant, I saw my face. <laughs> I was kind of horrified by that. <laughs> but I was amazed by it. I was amazed by it, that it's like looking in a, a mirror. And, and I was filled with all these emotions and these feelings, and, and suddenly I got this, this incredible, deep, intuitive sense at the very center of who I am that says, this is kind of what the Father says and feels when he looks at the Son. I see myself. He, I am in, an, am in him. He is a reflection of me. And God in his infinite wisdom and his, in his goodness is making the mystery of the divine family, Father, Son, and Spirit, available to us. We can see a reflection of him in the human family. The human family points to God. Two who become one, a third who comes, all who are one flesh. If that is true, then there's something about the human family that is exceedingly sacred and it's important that we we order it after the pattern of the divine family there's something at stake here when it comes to this issue of marriage it points to the reality of who god is it also points to the reality of what all of human history is all about if i were to return to that passage in ephesians chapter 5 that i mentioned at the beginning Paul is talking in verse 32 about how the two become one, and he says this is a mega mysterion, the Greek, a mega mystery. This is a huge, profound mystery. It's this radical, extraordinary, great, and wonderful, and profound truth that can only be understood with the help of God. And this is what it means, he says. When the two become one, this is what it means. It is a picture of Christ and his church. It's a picture. When God instituted and designed marriage, he already had Christ and the church in mind. He was thinking about the end. What can I put into place? What can I hardwire into the fabric of, of humanity that points to my greater purposes? What human history is all about? The goal of all, of all of our worship and all of our faith and all of our lives as Christians is to one day be seated at that marriage supper of the Lamb, this banquet where the bride is presented to her groom. The one that you are betrothed to now, you will be united with for eternity. And marriage points to that. When the two become one, it points to that. Dennis Kinlaw says that marriage is a divine pedagogical tool. It's a teaching tool. To teach human creatures what human history is all about. And as such, marriage and the gospel end up explaining one another. So if I were to talk to a husband and say, do you want to know how to love your wife? Where am I going to point? I'm going to point to Jesus. That's what Paul does. Ephesians 5. You want to know how to love your wife? Look to Christ. The gospel shows you how to be a husband, what it means to be a husband, how to lay your life down that this person might live and become holy and become beautiful. Everything God designed the woman to be, she can become as the man gives his life away for her sake. The gospel explains marriage. And marriage also explains the gospel. I can ask the next question. Husbands, do you want to know how you can be a witness to the world about the goodness of, and the truth of the gospel? Love your wives. 
Love your wives. As you lay your life down for your wife, you are preaching the gospel to the world. You are preaching the gospel. Marriage points to the gospel. The gospel shows us how marriage works best. It only becomes what it was meant to be when it approximates the pattern of God's saving love in Christ. Marriage means a lot. Jesus says, <laughs> I love his response to these Pharisees trying to trap him. Haven't you read the Bible? <laughs> Haven't you read the scriptures? You're trying to trap me in a question, but it's all here. Just look to here. The answers are there. Do you want to know why there are two and only two genders? Look to the Bible. Do you want to understand what marriage means and how it works best? Why God instituted it? Look into the Bible. Do you want to know why it matters that you get marriage and sex and gender and relationships right? Look to the Bible. Look to his word. God had a, a, a purpose in mind when he created the world like he did, and he's made it known to us. This, it's not a mystery any longer. It's been revealed. God's design is that we might image him in this world, that we might point to what human history is all about, to what his purposes for all of time are. His will is that we, in our lives and in our relationships, in our community as the people of God, might come to be defined by what defines him. Persons in and for another. That our, our families would point to what Christ wants to be and do with his, with his bride at the end of time. Covenantal love that lasts forever. Now that all sounds great. And thank you, Jesus, for pointing us to the scriptures. But how did the Pharisees respond? Well, they, they, they did what they did best and what, unfortunately, sometimes we're guilty of doing best. They gave Jesus lip. You've heard that phrase before. Don't give me lip. It's when a kid talks back. Don't give me lip. They give him lip. And you know, the problems today, the the, the, rate, the divorce rate, the marriage rate, all the, the sentiments, the attitudes towards marriage, this negativity, this, this idea of marriage being in decline, those problems are not with marriage's design. There's nothing wrong with God's design in marriage. The problem is us, people. What follows after Genesis chapter 2? Genesis chapter 3. And what we find in Genesis chapter 3 is that marriage, along with every other aspect of human life, has been broken by sin. You see it in the statistics. You see it in the news. I was, I came, I was, I've been compiling over the last few weeks stories about the, 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 the culture who was in opposition to a biblical vision of marriage. And it became so overwhelming, it was just too many to even bring. We live in a culture in, in utter opposition to God. And what's interesting is that these modern views of marriage and sexuality and identity are called progressive, when in fact, they're not progressive at all. They're regressive. Paul says in Romans chapter 1 that since the beginning, people in their sinfulness have rejected the truth of God, and as a result, they've chosen to worship the creation rather than the creator. And how does that express itself? Well, in Romans chapter 1, the very first way that it expresses itself is through sexual immorality. That's the first place we go in our rebellion against God. And it's followed, Gen uh, Romans 1.29, by every other kind of wickedness. I'm not trying to pick on one type of sin. All of sin is a response of worshiping the creation rather than the creator, of getting God's order all out of whack. My point is that, is that from the beginning, this opposition to God has defined sinful, wicked, corrupted people. The world opposes God's design, and it does so aggressively. But the real tragedy is when this opposition, when this confusion creeps into the church. In Matthew 19, it's not just the Pharisees giving Jesus lip about marriage. It's his disciples. His disciples. And each new day today, it seems, there's another story about some mega pastor coming out declaring that the Bible's clear teachings on marriage and sexuality and gender 
are outdated or need to be reinterpreted, need to be updated somehow. We see whole denominations being ripped apart before our very eyes. You don't think that's happening? Keep an eye on the news this coming February and see what I'm talking about. Too many in the church have adopted this notion that sexuality and marriage are private things. They're my business. It's not your business. They don't affect you. They, don't only, they only affect me. And as a result, we reject all authority. We don't want any accountability. We want to have our way. Leave me alone. Too many in the church stand in front of God and in front of the, the people of God and make vows that they don't really mean. And it reveals that we as Christians have adopted a view of marriage as little more than a a means to serial monogamy. I believe in monogamy. Just, I get to choose which woman I want to be with at a time. Marriage is serial monogamy, not lifelong partnership. Listen, if we are going to be the faithful church that God has called us to be, one that images God, one that proclaims the gospel, not just through our words, but through our life and our family and what we value and what we cherish and what we champion. It begins with our confession of our sins before God, of repenting of our own failures, our own sinfulness. We have to reject that temptation to ignore what God's word says or to try to reinterpret it to make it fit with what I want it to say or to outright disobey God's word. We have to repent of that. The problem is not marriage. The problem is us. As I surveyed the scene, as well as as look into my own heart, we who cling to the truth of God's word have failed in oftentimes one of two ways. The first is cowardice or silence. We're afraid to speak up, aren't we? We know what happens when we do. You see it in the news. You try to stand for the truth of God's word in the face of a hostile culture. I hope you're prayed up and ready for what happens. We don't want to be labeled. We don't want to be looked down on. We don't want to be persecuted. We don't want to suffer. And so we stay silent. I think a lot of us, myself included, could help ourselves by looking to the example of John the Baptist, this teacher, this prophet, to whom people from all around the region came to hear, lauded by the people. He was even respected and revered by King Herod, who was fascinated with him. But guess what? John the Baptist wasn't content to stay silent, was he? He was not afraid to call sin by its name, No matter who heard and no matter the cost to himself. And so, when Herod divorced his wife and took on his brother's wife, John John the Baptist called it it what it was. And he ended up in prison and his head ended up on a plate. He was so committed to the purposes of God's design. He was so submitted to the truth, the authority of God's word, that he was willing to die for it. Are we willing to die for the truth of God's word? It's a challenging question. Now, at the other end of the spectrum from cowardice is an eagerness to dish out death and judgment. I think we're guilty of that, too. This other end of the spectrum is is epitomized by these extreme groups like Westboro Baptist. If you don't know anything about them, consider yourself blessed. A hateful group of people that 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 claim the name of Jesus but don't but don't live out that claim. These are the ones who put signs into the hands of children that say, God hates America, God hates Jews, God hates fags. You know how hard it is to say that up here? I feel dirty just even talking like that. These groups should be denounced and rejected completely by all who bear the name of Jesus. And while we say amen and we agree to that, listen, the temptation, folks, the temptation is to be just like them in our hearts. 
just like them. We may not be holding a sign out there saying, God hates, pick your demographic. But in our hearts, is that, when our, what our, what our, is that not what our hearts sometimes say towards people not like us, people who disagree with us, people who live a different way than we do? It would do us good to remember the story of, of Jesus and his disciples in Luke chapter 9 when, they, when they're starting to head through the villages of Samaria. Luke begins the chapter saying, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, which means what? Where is he going? He's going to a cross. He sends his disciples ahead to make provision, to, make, to find a place to stay. And what did the Samar- Samaritans do? They kick him out. They reject the disciples, and by, ver- by extension, they reject Jesus. What's, the, what's the, the, the plan that James and John put into place to respond to this? Do you remember? Lord, let's call down fire from heaven and burn it all up. And Jesus said, all right, let's do it. No, no. Yes, these people reject you. Yes, these people reject me. But I'm headed to a cross. I'm headed to a cross. I rebuke you. And he looks at our hearts that are full of the same type of hatred and disgust. And he says, I rebuke that. That is not of me. The mission of the Son of God was not to destroy, but to redeem. The mission of the Son of God is not to hate, but to love. It is not to kill, it is to die. And those who would follow him can only do so faithfully when we find a way to balance in perfect harmony both truth and love. Nowhere else is that better seen than on a cross where the truth of God's hatred and judgment against sin, his holiness is declared, but also his love for sinful people. Always held together. That vertical beam and that cross beam never come apart. The truth from heaven, the love for the world are always held together perfectly in him. He says, if you want to be like me, if you want to follow me, if you want to belong to me, you'll look like this. Yes, be willing to die for the truth, but never kill. Yes, stand for what is right, but only do it for the well-being of another, not at the expense of another. Yes, join God in his righteous, holy hatred of all sin, but not just the sins of others. His, your sin as well. Do you hate your own sin? We love hating other sins, don't we? Do you hate your own sin? Will you join God in his righteous hatred of all sin? But will you also, will you also join him in his unconditional holy love for all the world? All the world. Even the unlovable. Especially the unlovable. For this is how God showed his great love for us. By sending Christ to die while we were yet still sinners. Mm. He laid down his life for you and for me and for everyone else when we least deserved it. Your mission, church, should you choose to accept it, is twofold today. Yes, I'm calling you to reject the world's ideas about marriage and sex and identity. You cannot trust your emotions on this. You cannot do it. Your emotions will betray you. You cannot look to your family to make sense of this. Because you and I have people in our families that that don't cling to the truth of God's word. or Or have different sins or struggles than you. You can't base your opinion and your perspective on what your emotions say or what someone in your family might say, you cannot follow the lead of the culture. The culture, the world, is in opposition to God and his design and his ways. Therefore, you and I must cling to the clear teaching of God's word with boldness, with confidence, with conviction, without shame, even when it's hard, even in the face of opposition, even in the face of persecution. And I tell you something, if you... 
If you cling to the truth of his word, you will be persecuted somehow in this life. It will be hard. It will be painful to you. But it's right. It's right. And it's good. And it's worth doing. But you and I must also work to build a marriage culture where God's glorious vision for the family can flourish. Not just for the the good of your family and not even for the good of our church, but for the good of all. If marriage is how God, one of the ways, if not the chief way, is is revealing the deep mysteries of the triune life, if, if marriage is how God is showing the world what the gospel is pointing to, what it's all about, then how important should it be to us to champion marriage, to champion God's design for sexuality, to champion God's pattern of humanity, male and female, coming together in beautiful union. And this idea of cultivating a marriage culture is exactly what I hope to explore over the coming weeks as we dive into this new series together. And if you are married or if you're single, if you're old or if you're young, you have a place in this culture. This is, these are not sermons for the married. These are not sermons for the gay. These are not sermons for the, the gender confused. This is for all. This is for all of God's people. You have a part to play in the formation, the cultivation of a marriage culture. And it requires more than just lamenting the state of the, the, state of the world. Oh, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. It's going to be more than that. It's going to mean repenting. Repenting of your sexual sins. Repenting of your hatred for others. Repenting of your disobedience to his word. Repentance of your lack of faith and trust in his design. And following your repentance must come an affirmation, a celebration of God's design without doubt, without fear, and without shame. God's design is good. The problem is not with marriage. The problem is with me. And lastly, if we are going to build the type of culture here that honors Christ, it's going to involve embracing the lost. It's going to involve embracing the confused. It might even involve embracing your enemy in humility and in self-giving love. Success is not having church members say, Gay marriage is wrong. That's not success. Success is when the biblical vision of marriage and sex and gender is so beautiful and present and clear that everything else pales in comparison. That's success. And the answers are here. The secrets of the mystery revealed. Let us proclaim them to the world in truth and in love. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we submit this morning, some of us easily and some of us with great difficulty, to your good design. Lord, forgive us where we have doubted the truth of your word, where we have seeked to tweak it to suit our own needs, or where we have downright disobeyed it. Lord, forgive us. We repent of that this morning. We want to turn from our wickedness, turn from our obstinance, turn from our disobedience, and surrender to you, even if it means receiving the the aggressive hostility of the world. Lord, you promised us that in this world we would find trouble, but you also promised that you'd be with us to the end of the age. Blessed are those who are persecuted for your name's sake. Lord, we're not making ourselves martyrs as though we're some sort of victim. We just want to be yoked to you. And if that means suffering in the process, Lord, give us the grace and the strength and the resolve 
to do so with integrity and with humility and in love, giving ourselves away, even for our accusers. Because that's your, that's your pattern. <laughs> You've shown us how to do it, how to do it, and we want to follow you. Help us to follow you by your grace, by your strength, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going